Good morning. How are you? It's it's really bright. It's like <laughs> so that that thing will move to the presenter later, right? No. What thing is wrong? The the spotlight. Yeah, it's a real main one. Yeah. Um, see. Oh, bit. thank you. It's too bright. Yeah. You cannot see anything. And it's morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's actually recording. We said actually everything what? we said. Yeah. Yeah. When when it starts again, I think. Good morning, routing. Welcome to Brisbane ITF 119. And let's start. Not well. You're coming to ATF meetings. Please make sure you're familiar with not well. Uh, there's a number of documents that we advise you to read in order to get familiar with ATF process. We've got new RFC, uh, Young Data Model for Web Extensions, since uh, 118. Draft submitted to publication are updated to VRRP. Thanks, AC and Carter, some great work on this. And the segment routing TILFA, it's been a couple of years, uh, needs from last review to be addressed. Dear Carter, if you are listening, please let's finish it. Hello. So the document status uh, for BGP peak, uh, there's more work that's needed before second working of last call. There's good progress. QoS model, uh, we were considering close to be done, but they received really significant amount of comments. So we will need also to figure out how to continue with it. One of co-authors has become uh, AD. So uh, we will work with uh, the rest of uh, co-authors and uh, if someone wants to help with it more than welcome uh, net to cloud uh, general consensus uh, so working group plus call is done we've got last uh, set of comments from uh, SecDeer after uh, Linda and co-authors address them we will submit the document to LG and the VRRP point to multipoint BFD pending uh, early review so it's in progress Uh, agenda for today. So as you know, starting from ITF 117, uh, we co-chairs of Routing Work Group started running site meeting called uh, AI in data center. So it become very, very popular. Uh, we have not have recording for first one. Unfortunately, it died somewhere in WebEx. <laughs> There's recording for uh, 118. We don't do it this ATF because of difference in times. We really couldn't get people to present four o'clock in the mornings. So we've got really exciting agenda for you in Vancouver, and we plan to continue doing this with more and more material, people from the industry, from academia, and networking in machine learning cluster is an important topic. That's you know probably the hottest topic in networking right now. Oh, yeah, by the way, so thanks to our ideas, we got uh, email and list allocated. Please subscribe to IDC at ITF.org rather than watching it on routing and potentially other working groups. All the communication updates, announcements are going to happen on AIDC. And we are updating our wiki. You okay? Yeah, don't tell. So, uh, for the routing, 
RTCWG Wiki, we do have our information updated there. If you are looking for something about a document, you can go check out there. Or if you, you can always check with uh, the chairs, see the latest status. Uh, Linda. Okay, uh, let's get to the presentations. You see your slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you can run your. Okay. So, um, so this is just the Linda. update. Linda. Okay. Um, so we just gave um, an update um, on this. Um, here's the background of this document in case people who are new to this document. This is really talking about um, enterprise um, who have services in the cloud and have many services terminated in the cloud, but they also have services between uh, CPEs and they would like to uh, leverage the cloud, back, cloud backbone to transit the IPsec encrypted traffic across uh, further distances and through the backbone. And, uh, and the, 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 um, between the CPEs, um, they are already uh, IPsec encrypted. And um, so uh, this document is to um, identify, I mean, specify a method for the cloud gateway to transit without further decrypt the traffic and re-encrypt the traffic for the uh, transit traffic. So um, there are many thanks to Adrian Farrell that the um, routing directory review had many, many, many comments um, that is on the mailing list. Um, everybody have to seen that. Um, so lots and lots of wording. Um, uh, revision and adding the justification uh, why we need Geneva and what we do with um, how do they handle the uh, gateway um, Geneva um, encapsulation and decapsulation and how to process the sub TLVs and um, making the document more readable. Uh, many thanks to Adrian's uh, very, very detailed reviews and comments. And uh, um, meanwhile, we also added two new sub TLVs. Um, one is the include transit. These are uh, basically uh, enterprise would like to um, include particular regions um, to um, uh, transit the traffic from um, one gateway to another gateway. Um, another one is exclude. And uh, there are lots of discussion on that. The node ID Primarily, um, we had the string, but there was some issue with that. So now we change to the node ID, just numerical ID, make it very straightforward and uh, make sure that um, those um, 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 transit uh, sub TOVs, there could be multiple of them and they are a set of them, not an order list. Same is true with ex excluded transit nodes. And uh, so in summary, this document specify a new uh, Geneva option class. And underneath this new option class, um, there are five uh, sub TLVs specified. One is the endpoint sub TLV, an originator sub TLV, and egress gateway, just in case the CPE is aware of uh, have some preference on which gateway to egress the traffic. Because um, uh, for some of the SD1 traffic, some of the um, uh, paths is like private VPN or private circuit. Um, they may prefer that, e that gateway instead of just the typical um, internet gateway. And uh, include transit sub TLV and exclude. So that's the major part of this document. And uh, so we have asked for the working group adoption and uh, hope to get more comments from the working group. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions? Pop up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have never tried this before. So for the first time, let's do a show of hands. Uh, do you think this document, uh, the, the, the 
multi-segment SD1 as described in this draft is a use case that ISTF should work on. Please, um, all the people on site, make sure you scan that QR code so you can use the... And uh, so you know, we don't use blue anymore. So this is your way to let us know that you're here. Uh, oh. you, did you scan that? So now showing up on your phone? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you, you, no. That's weird. Huh? It's our first time to use this tool, so I don't know how it works. Does it show up on your phone? No, no, we're good. Oh. And I think it's a pool that's not showing up everywhere. I don't know, does it show up on your screen? I haven't tried. No, so it shows up there, but not here, I'm not sure why. And, so you, and you, you do you, see it, right? You have to be able to vote, right? Yeah. Let's give it a few more minutes. Yeah. On the laptop? Well, new experience. IT services. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we have a second question. We need to record this. I think it, 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 it like automatically. Mm -hmm. So has everybody who wanted to vote voted? So it shows pretty good support. 20 against nine. Let's try another one. Do you support adoption of this work in RTCWG? If you say no, that means an objection. Working better this time? Yeah. So there's some contradictory because people say, people think it should dominate here, but not in our working group. So we can click on this box. Do you know why they don't use case? Yeah, you can see. We have some support. Uh, 
Oh, please make sure you scan the QR code join from your phone or you join from your laptop. You can use only one of them, right? And then go in. Three, two, one. Okay, we are done with this. We have some support, but not many. So we'll take it also to the list to yeah, get we'll all the people the who list. haven't been able to vote right now oh you if if you didn't get a chance to read the draft please read the draft okay so next steps are to take it to the list and get better view okay. but at least it looks like we collaborate to support the youth case so thank you okay let's go to the next presentation Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so you can pass control. Do you want us to pass control to you or move the slides? Uh, I, I yeah, I want to control myself. Uh, how, how? Hold on, just give a second. Click this. You should be able to move the slides now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ethan Liu from China Mobile. Uh, today, I will uh, introduce the uh, uh, Path Aware Remote Protection Framework on behalf of my co authors. Uh, firstly, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, a current IP network, we have uh, uh, mainly uh, two types of the uh, protection um, mechanisms. Uh, one is the local protection, like the RFA or TRFA. Uh, <clears throat> only perceive the local uh, failures and require the IGP. And the other uh, is the E2E protection. And uh, it depends the uh, head end, head end uh, performs the detection and the switch over. And uh, <clears throat> there are some uh, networks that uh, cannot cover, and like uh, in the fig left uh, in the, in the uh, left of the slide, uh, <clears throat> like in the span leaf uh, based on the data centers and network, uh, only BGP protocol is pro deployed, so there is no uh, IGP, and uh, uh, that <clears throat> there is only uh, IP based uh, best uh, effort uh, for the, uh, no traffic engineer. So when the failure occurs, uh, for example, in the fig, uh, on uh, on the link between the span two uh, uh, and the uh, leaf three, uh, <clears throat> so leaf one will continue to send traffic to both the uh, span one and span two uh, until the uh, leaf one uh, receives the BGP uh, withdrawal uh, from the span two. Uh, so uh, the the waiting for the control plane convergence will be very uh, long. <clears throat> Especially uh, for uh, there is a, a lot of uh, 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 <clears throat> BDP routes, routes. So uh, we want to uh, <clears throat> give a, a mechanism that uh, the idea is that uh, allow the lead one to uh, detect the remote failure uh, on the link, like a lag like between the uh, span one and the leaf three, and uh, and that will evoke the uh, faster repairs. Uh, <clears throat> we give uh, uh, two uh, use cases uh, for this uh, mechanism uh, framework. Uh, the one is that uh, the spa leaf uh, network. Uh, for this use case, uh, for example, from H1 to H3, uh, we have uh, two uh, next hops. Uh, for uh, well, when the failure occurs on the link between uh, span two and the leaf three, and uh, the the <coughs> span two will detect uh, uh, a failure because uh, it uh, can connect the the link directly, 
and then it can notify the leaf one and the failure on the link between the span two and the leaf three. So uh, the leaf one will find the next hub, uh, 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 span two, uh, the, whose path uh, has a failure. So uh, it can uh, remove the uh, uh, span two uh, uh, from the XMP. And he can still uh, forward in the path uh, along the span one. Uh, for the use case two, uh, like in the uh, Dragonfly network, and uh, for example, for the R1, we have uh, uh, the primary net hub, next hub R2, and the backup next hub R3. And uh, uh, with the same uh, <coughs> situation, uh, when the failure occurs on the link between the group one and the group three, so the R2 will detect the failure because it connect. Uh, uh, the link uh, directly, and uh, he will notify uh, the R1 <coughs> of the failure. Uh, and R1 will find that the uh, uh, next stop, uh, R2, uh, has, a, has a failure. Uh, so uh, it, it can switch from the primary uh, R2 to the backup R3. Uh, so for the framework, uh, framework we have uh, uh, we define uh, three layers uh, of this uh, uh, <coughs> mechanism. One is the uh, path aware routing plane, and the routing plane, uh, the route uh, calculation is not limited to the next hop, but uh, requires uh, the path aware, path awareness <coughs> for the uh, for the next hop. Uh, so the uh, path information we will uh, download to the uh, forwarding plane, and uh, <coughs> When the when the uh, failure occurs in any component along the path, uh, it is required to uh, uh, quickly detect the uh, failure and uh, will notify the uh, password uh, forwarding plan. Uh, the the uh, the three parts of uh, this uh, framework. Uh, the first one is the remote failure uh, detection. Uh, for this detection, uh, <clears throat> and it is first detect when, when, when a failure occurs, and the first detect by the uh, device uh, adjacent to it. it uh, uh, when it connect uh, directly, so the local failure detection may be based on the existing techniques such as the uh, port detection or the BFD, etc. <clears throat> so and uh, the device uh, will, will uh, <coughs> detect the failure and will uh, notify its neighbors uh, of the failure. And uh, the failure notification between the uh, neighbor between the neighbors uh, will have the following uh, requirements. One is that it will uh, depend independent of the routing protocols, and uh, the other is that it will. Uh, avoid uh, uh, broadcast broadcast for flooding the, the message. Uh, so uh, this example, like uh, the, for the uh, two methods, uh, for uh, one for the BFD detect a, a link failure, the other is uh, uh, detect the traffic. And for the uh, pass wire forwarding plan. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, each uh, next hop for the uh, for the entry, uh, we have a we with a with a pass uh, information. One uh, receiving the failure notification from a neighbor, so the next hop entries uh, corresponding to the neighbor, uh, we will check uh, whether the associated uh, pass information uh, contains the failed component. So. Uh, if detect any failure in the past, in the past uh, associated uh, the next hop, so the next hop uh, uh, regarded as the failed. So for the uh, routing plan, uh, well, when uh, the calculated the, the routes and the past information will uh, will needed uh, to uh, 
attached to the next home. And the specific uh, uh, extension of the uh, routing protocol, like uh, IGP and BDP, uh, are out of the scope of, scope of the uh, framework. And uh, we'll, <coughs> we, we, we plan to discuss uh, in a separate uh, draft uh, in the future. Uh, the row types of uh, this framework, uh, we have uh, three types of uh, nodes. For the uh, remote pair, remote repair node, uh, in uh, like in the fake, uh, it has the re repair pass uh, and uh, like the <coughs> primary and the backup, uh, and uh, it can uh, remote it provides the remote protection function. And uh, the second is the local detection node. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> This type of the nodes uh, can uh, detect the failure directly, and uh, it will uh, send the notification to the remote repair node. And the third type of, of the uh, of the uh, node is the <coughs> intermediate intermediate node. Uh, only if there are multiple hops between the remote repair repair node and the local detection node. Uh, it can uh, exist, and uh, it will uh, uh, deliver the failure notification message from the local uh, detection node to the uh, remote repair node. And if uh, if, on, if oh, only uh, two hops uh, uh, from the repair, remote repair node to the failure, uh, so there is no uh, intermediate node. Uh, so the for the uh, scope or coverage scope of the uh, this uh, uh, pass aware uh, remote protection, uh, <laughs> it can cover from the like the remote repair node to the failure, and the minimum scope covers two hops. But uh, as uh, with uh, with the protection uh, scope increase, uh, the the number of the intermediate nodes will uh, increase, and uh, uh, that may uh, slow down the current times and uh, expand the uh, propagation of the fault notification. Uh, uh, like in the uh, smart leaf uh, network, uh, it can uh, uh, it maybe there are uh, multiple levels in in the smart leaf networks, but uh, uh, we recommend that uh, the remote protection uh, cover uh, two hops. Uh, otherwise, uh, there are too many uh, messages for notification, and the uh, convergence time will uh, slow. So, next steps, uh, we will discuss uh, uh, more about the solutions for the framework, like in the uh, routing plan or uh, 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 routing uh, uh, forwarding plan and the 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 detection and technologies and the know how to uh, notify and uh, we 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 also uh, seek more uh, scenarios for uh, this form uh, this framework so welcome any uh, questions or comments thank you Linda <clears throat> This is Linda Damba from Futureway. So um, I'm not too clear on this. Um, do you enable BGP or do you enable IGP or do you have BFD? Do any of them being enabled or no? Uh, we, uh, we, 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 we can also uh, use the existing uh, uh, technology, a bit like, like, like the uh, failure detection. We, 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 we will use the uh, BFD uh, for the uh, uh, detection, but uh, how to notify this uh, failure? We we, we need a, we need we need a, a more uh, uh, discuss or, or analyze. But we so we, because... we we haven't uh, provided the the solution for for this. So this, you that, will use BFD. Just want to confirm, you will use BFD for local detection, but for um, propagate the um, local failure to remote node, they're no, not using the IGP to propagate the failure you're using something else uh, yeah we uh, uh we want to uh, we 
we we we have we have we haven't uh, have a, a a more specific uh, uh, solution on how to uh, how to notify this uh, this uh, failure uh, message. Uh, but but we uh, we want to use uh, uh, the the extension for uh, for uh, BGP or IGP. Okay. Thank you. David. Uh, David, <coughs> David Lamparder. Um, uh, it's not clear to me why this would be any faster than the existing notification mechanisms. Um, are you trying to fix issues in BGP specifically, or are you trying to work around implementations being slow, or are you trying to work around IGPs not carrying this fast enough, or uh, what exactly will be improved here? Uh, in in uh, uh, we 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 uh, we want to use in the uh, uh, in in a specific uh, topology like like the Spanly uh, network or the uh, Dragonfly uh, network. Uh, so uh, uh, in, in uh, like like in, like in the BDP, we haven't uh, we we want to. Uh, uh, Make make the failure uh, convergence uh, more fast. Uh, Ant Antoni. Yeah. Hello, um, I have a question. When you when the local node detects a failure and sends a notification upstream. And um, how do you select in your framework the remote repair node? And is there a mechanism in which this repair node is positioned as a candidate, but other repair node may repair the path more upper stream? Uh, how do you pick your re remote uh, repair node? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, I, I I will discuss with my uh, co-authors and then we, uh, I will give a uh, yeah. this, this reply. Okay. Yes. Uh, sure. We can discuss this off offline on the mailing list if you want. Okay. Um, if you prefer. I think it would be very useful if you send the question to the mailing list so it doesn't get lost in translation. Okay, I will do that. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, you're on mute, I think. No, it's better? Yeah. Oh, fine. Thank you. Um, Maria, uh, developer of uh, BERT, um, I am uh, basically thinking that uh, either you are trying to fix problems with using BGPs as an internal, uh, internal protocol, and with that, uh, you should probably look into your policies and uh, make them better. Uh, not like uh, change the uh, or not, not like to, to propose uh, more uh, more layers uh, of uh, notifications or the other th the other method the other version is that you actually want to use uh, an actual existing internal routing protocol or design a completely new one uh, but from this I don't see uh, anything implementable and don't see uh, anything uh, leading to a conclusion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We 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 will uh, we will uh, uh, dis uh, discuss more, uh, and uh, we will give a uh, more specific uh, solution next time, maybe. Jeffrey. Jeffrey Dong from Juniper. Um, so, if I understand you correctly, this is not a problem for you <clears throat> if you're running IGP, but if you're running BGP, then you have an issue, um, depending on the implementation, I guess. Um, then there is this Rift protocol. I think I solved this problem perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robin? Uh, 
Robin from Huawei. So uh, I remember we have uh, the mechanism of the interworking uh, between the BFD sessions. I mean, so the, if the failure detected by the uh, BFD session and uh, can be sent this failure notification by another BFD interworked, uh, can, can this mechanism be used for this uh, uh, scenario or not? I'm not sure. Uh. Okay, we 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 will we will consider that, but we <laughs> haven't uh, discussed that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Robin, please send your question to the list. I don't think he catches all the information. So I think you meant BFD tracking. When when downstream session goes down, you bring down the upstream session, which is a matter of local implementation. It's not something for ATF really. So uh, I think this draft is uh, related to, uh, oh, this is Wei Changcheng from China Mobile. Uh, uh, I think the last meeting uh, in uh, RTGWT, I presented a, 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 a draft uh, related to the requirements for the protection in the data center, especially for the AI data center. Uh, I think that draft uh, analyzed uh, uh, the protection requirement and uh, some gap um, uh, from the current uh, uh, solutions. I think Isun's draft uh, gave some um, uh, direction how we can uh, meet the AI data center's requirement. Because uh, uh, if you just uh, have uh, such as uh, uh, 50, 15, uh, 50 millisecond recover, that's not enough. Uh, I think the draft provides some direction which can uh, provide such as a, a microsecond protection possibility. So I think it, it, it's a good direction, uh, but we really need some specific solutions. Uh, I think the draft is valid. Uh, and uh, it's valuable for us to dig into the solutions uh, for the data center, especially such as uh, the spine leaf uh, architecture. The topology is really simple and uh, we can develop some uh, high efficient solutions. So that, that's my comments, thanks. Thank you. So a uh, couple of comments here. Uh, Well-tuned routing protocol can provide very, very fast signaling. I mean, well-tuned BGP can do it probably within 50 to 100 milliseconds, Rift can do it below, right? So unless it can offer something better than that, I don't think this complexity is actually worth working on it. Uh, probably, I would think you're thinking about some kind of data plane notification, which brings very, very different set of problems with it. First of all, it needs to be routable. If you have more than three stages, you might need to traverse more than one stage. So you need to be able to route this packet back. Number two, when you lose a link in third or fifth stage, you actually don't lose the reachability. You reduce the amount of bandwidth available. So you might think of including some kind of weight into this notification, which will potentially blow up your feed. Three, if you key on router ID your RIP next hub groups, it will blow up your RIP eventually. So there's a lot of to think about it. We've been presenting different solutions for kind of data plane notifications since 1998. This is the first presentation routing, at least I could find. So take a look at what has been discussed, why we stopped this work eventually. And the uh, problem is valid. I mean, it takes time for BGP or any other routing protocol to notify not directly connected failure. But the complexity should not you know, outweigh the benefits. OK, thank you. Jeff? Yeah. Jeff has Juniper. Apologies, I missed the presentation itself and I sped read through the notes. Um, th there's a work in IDR and probably work that will go elsewhere in ITF, which might you know, be RTGWG when we do the second half. The piece that's visible in IDR right now is work I'm doing with Kevin Wang for next, next top nodes. You know, this is basically a way of 
providing the glue where of what is upstream for your ECMP paths, which is at least a portion of the problem that's being covered here. The second piece that we haven't put a draft out yet, which I think has also good overlap, is that global convergence for the protocols, even if you have, you know, as much as I'm a fan of BGP, and you know, Drift is a good answer for a lot of the global cases, if you have rapid churn or partial degrades, you know, due to, for example, too much traffic across one member, you don't want to be flapping the protocols very hard, very fast to try to accommodate these things. The uh, proposal that we'll be taking forward and providing at least uh, you know, some sketch out is provide the glueware, let the uh, nodes know what their upstream members are, and then provide a dynamic signaling layer that allows for the ECMPs to be dynamically tuned outside of routing. So. I, I think that uh, that proposal is probably very general for a lot of these types of cases. The one that we're specifically covering is simply you know, uh, the immediate adjacent upstreams rather than more global like the Dragonfly topology that's inside of the uh, uh, presentation. So hopefully this is part of the landscape that can uh, help us out. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, Kiyur. Hey, Kiyur Patel Arkas. Um, it, I think we'll all benefit if the problem definition comes out to be a little more clearer. If you need convergence, which is less than sub 50 milliseconds, what are you seeing? What kind of topologies it is? Because while you can tune protocols to get there, certainly for sub, something less than sub 50 milliseconds, um, you need to do this outside the control plane. And there has been interesting work going on in different bodies like Ultra Ethernet Consortium where they can actually are working towards predicting failures or trying to get around the failure paths at a uh, you know rate which is faster than sub 50 milliseconds. So there's, I think getting a problem definition would be uh, crisper, would be helpful, and then working with some of these consortiums may also help you. Thank you, Kier. Thank you for the comments. And we've got Dima. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Uh, regarding uh, that routing around failures and quick detection, obviously, if you want to have really quick mechanisms, they should be probably data plane based. And there is also interesting work uh, which was discussed uh, at one of the previous ITF meetings, which is endpoint based routing around failures, uh, which uses retransmit timeouts and flow labels, or actually any kind of entropy in the protocol headers. Uh, it can detect and route around failures um, on the order of 100 milliseconds, maybe faster, basically depends on route trip time in the network. And um, in typical data center network, if we don't have full queues, round trip times are really small. And uh, such approach uh, has uh, a very significant advantage is that it's completely orthogonal to the routing mechanisms. And it also works in case of gray failures. Thank you. So, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, the talk was named self healing networks with flow labels. Thanks, Dima. So about six or seven ideas ago, we have presentation uh, on the topic. So it's host-based, change of entropy based on uh, RTO timeout and TCP. There are a lot of work going on in the industry right now where we do this with uh, congestion control signaling. So something you alluded to. But all of this work is done on the endpoints, not on the intermediate devices, which is mostly the focus here. So again, there's a lot of work that allows endpoint to change uh, one of the fields that would be used for entropy and probabilistically reroute the route over another link. So you might want to look into this work, but probably it's less in scope of this working group rather than routing itself. Okay, uh, if no more questions, we go to the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Shu Yang from Shenzhen University, and today I'm going to present destination source routing again. Uh, this draft has a long history. About 10 years ago, uh, David proposed this draft, and five years later, uh, the authors asked for the last call in the working group, and then nothing happened. Uh, but we still need the ability to take source address into account while making routing decisions. So in 2022, uh, we proposed a uh, resubmit this draft and then presented it at, at, at the ZIT meeting. And now it is the second version. Uh, there are many use cases for source des destination routing. For example, uh, IPv6 smart homing using peer addresses. Uh, traffic engineering and segmentation, uh, access control for specific, uh, specific uh, source address, and a few other use cases. Uh, for example, we can use uh, source destination routing in ingress filtering on the upstream routers. Although other routing mechanisms such as MTR, PBR, and layer 3 VPN can also solve the problem. Uh, but we still need the, the ability and the flexibility in routing protocol. Uh, this draft is for IPv6, and this document defines the expected behavior, but not the exact algorithm. Uh, and we define that the source prefix is matched after the, after the destination prefix. Uh, recently, we also implement and deploy uh, the source destination routing in CERNET. It's still under the test uh, phase, uh, but we have updated about 20 uh, routers in CERNET to support the destina source destination routing. And the first scenario is load balancing. We try to uh, divert traffic from one path to another. Uh, also, uh, there are many uh, other, other scenarios, scenarios uh, but after using it, uh, we think there are uh, some advantage uh, of source destination routing. Uh, the first one is is easy to configure. We can we we just need to configure the cost of a des uh, source destination prefix pair. Uh, we don't need to configure it hop by hop. Uh, and the second is uh, that it has less headers compared with SRV six. And the last uh, the last is uh, it will lead to it will bring less less er errors and uh, loose loops because of automatic uh, routing uh, computation in the routing protocol. Uh, except uh, Sonnet, uh, they will also uh, implement it, it in FRR uh, a long time ago, and uh, Cisco has also implemented a prototype of the source, uh, destination source routing router. And there are many related drafts in source destination routing, and these are some of them. And so we think it is time to uh, ask for uh, uh, for the adoption in the working group. Uh, thank you. So we had a discussion with original authors and uh, the people who joined a, a team that's willingness to collaboratively work and we will we will work with them to fast track so there have been no changes in the last three or four uh leaps. yeah five years there's implementation in linux uh, there's implementation in the farrar so there's no really reason to you know john do you want to talk yeah just like to add one more use case which David, I guess, discovered recently, and we discovered recently as well. This has actually seemed to be required to properly implement the correct uh, source address selection in IPv6 in general, using Rule 5.5, in, at least in Linux. So yeah, so we need this not just for multi-homing, but for other like cases like flash renumbering, and other case for IPv6 to stack to work properly. So yeah, we, we now have a lot of compelling reasons to advance this, and yeah. I, I apologize for the delay for, with this draft, but yes, I think it's a good time to move it forward. Okay, so we'll be waiting on update from you. So the question is, how? what do you think? I think the current text 
seem to be in the good shape, right? We will review it a couple of times. Do you want us to resubmit it somehow with the current text, or we can just ask for adopt like what the suggested process would so be? So see if current text works for everybody, if it doesn't need any updates, and we'll fast track it, call for working group adoption, and eventually going into working with Pascal. Thank you. Another thing you can do is to add an implementation section, and that can be removed later, but it will be helpful too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we yes. just had a discussion between authors. Yeah, David has a long list of reference for implementations. We will, we will add it to the text problems and resubmit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hello, uh, Nangong from Huawei Technology. Uh, uh, first, uh, thank you for your responses in the mailing list uh, on my, to my questions. And uh, just a comment, uh, as you presented, the draft has, the, the work has started for a long time, at least 10 years. So there must be many discussions and uh, uh, many comments received. Uh, so uh, are there any places to track these uh, discussions or uh, issues so that we can uh, track whether the issues have been uh, fully uh, solved or some has been uh, fully solved. And uh, that will be helpful for the adoption, maybe. So the work has started in routing working group almost 10 years ago. Just uh, search in the mailing list and uh, all the communication is there. Uh, if you don't find an answer on the mailing list, you can always ask. Any other questions? If not, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tony. Hi, I'm Tony Lee. This talk is about routing on satellite networks. Uh, this is driven mostly by a lot of discussion that's been happening around LEO satellite constellations. Uh, this is a work in progress. There's lots of changes going on. Um, it's not set in stone in any way. So please, if you see something amiss, please bring it up. Uh, I'm an engineer. This is not marketing. There are no pretty pictures here. Uh, I'm a routing guy, not a satellite guy. If I get the satellite stuff wrong, please tell me. Um, there are lots of ways of solving this. There's other ideas that people are bouncing around. This is only one. Um, let's see, no satellite operators have commented on this. They were not abused. Um, and they have not abused me. So I'm operating with a lot, without a lot of free feedback here. Um, this is a discussion. Please feel free to interrupt. Uh, so satellite networks today look a little bit like this. Uh, we have the internet. We've got maybe a little terrestrial network. We've got a local gateway. Uh, it's got a big satellite dish. It talks to a bunch of satellites. And the novel thing that's happening today is that we now have inter-satellite links. And this is where the routing it gets interesting. We actually are using free space optics between satellites. And so things are flaky. Um, from those satellites, then you bounce down to user stations. And the most common application for doing all of this is to form an access network. So that's where this talk is focused. Uh, big problem we have to solve is scale. People are talking about floating tens of thousands of satellites. This makes for an interesting routing problem. They've got hundreds of gateways to circumvent the planet. And our links are going to be changing frequently. Um, some of them go out of service because the, the satellites go out of range of one another. Uh, so Inter-satellite links have a finite distance and um, angles, uh, occlusion by the sun, lots of reasons that they just simply can't work anymore. And they get reassigned and re, uh, reconnected on a regular basis. Uh, so they're basically very flaky. Um, this is for those of you who are old enough to know what a T1 is, uh, this is like operating a network with flaky T1s. We've seen this before. Uh, also, we know that we have finite capacity and we have infinite demand. 
So traffic engineering is a necessity. Um, ISLs are a very limited resource. Now, the only solution we have to create real uh, solution to a scalability problem is to install hierarchy. And so what I'm proposing is that we do exactly that. Uh, our link state IGPs, we already have two level hierarchy. And this is absolutely useful because it contains all the link change churn that the ISLs are going to give us. If you look at the way OSPF works, we've got an area zero backbone. We've got areas tangent to the backbone. I think all of you know this. Um, this is not a good fit because we don't have anything in the satellite network that works as a backbone. Uh, it just isn't there. ISIS is a little more general. It's a little more flexible because we can have level two, uh, which is the central portion of an ISIS network, but it can overlap areas in uh, uh, other areas in ISIS. And what we're going to propose for this solution is to actually have everything be in L2. Now, this would normally cause a gigantic scalability problem because you'd have L2 with all umpteen thousand nodes in it, but hang on, I've got a hack for that. The biggest problem we want to think about is area partition. Most of you are probably familiar with this. Um, if an area partitions in ISIS, things fall apart. There have been lots of folks who've worked on this over the years, going way, way back. Um, basic idea it, to solve this is to tunnel from one side of the partition to the other. And this has never been a very satisfactory solution. Um, our end solution has always been, don't do this. Do not set up your topology so that you end up with partitioning. On terrestrial networks, this is a matter of paying more money for more cost, so you have enough links. Uh, this is difficult to do in a satellite network, so how can we achieve this? How do we get areas that are not going to partition? Basic idea here is what we're calling a stripe. We're going to take satellites in adjacent orbits, and we're going to bond them together. And now, my PowerPoint skills aren't good enough to really show what this looks like, because the, the actual orbits are not actually parallel. They're offset and inclined one from one another. So it's, there's a lot of skew that's got to go in here. And those inter-satellite links cannot uh, cover the cases where there's maximum skew between various different orbits. However, adjacent orbits can have multiple inter-satellite links interconnecting them. And so the hack here is let's choose a stripe as the union of several orbits and enough orbits so that we do have continuous connectivity between all of these orbits. Okay. And the assumption is that there is a number that is large enough to do this without becoming too large for our protocol. Okay, once you've got a stripe, then things are pretty simple. We're just gonna wrap the planet in stripes. Okay. If you do that, then the ISIS topology looks pretty simple. Okay. We're going to use area proxy. This is a new extension to ISIS. We're going to represent each area as a single node at level two. And there's a separate internet draft already out there for how this is, it works. Um, we've got an implementation of this out there in the wild. It does work. Uh, this gives us a drastic improvement to scalability. Okay. Every area now is one node, and all of the noise inside of that area is just completely hidden from level two. So for our satellite network, area proxy now looks like this. We've got a level two link state database that's just the number of areas in the entire topology. So this is very small, very stable, and almost immune from ISL failure. Not a lot of churn going on. Now we do want to do traffic engineering because links aren't free. Um, I don't think anybody in this room needs to be convinced of that. 
And for this particular application, um, SRMPLS seems like the right solution, and you'll see why in a second. And by the way, I'm not a fan of SR in general, so this is amusing to find that this was the right answer. Um, basically, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take and have the gateway perform all of its traffic engineering functionality. All the traffic in a region is going to be flowing through the gateway, both uplinked and downlinked. So it has a full traffic matrix for everything that it needs to know going on. We're also gonna plug it in to, uh, to ISIS, and it's got several choices here. It can run ISIS level one directly if it's got connectivity to the satellites, all the satellites in the stripe, um, or it can get ISIS over a tunnel from a stripe that it's not connected to, or it can get the topology via BGPLS, again, for stripes that it's not connected to. Lots of ways of doing this, but basically the idea is we're gonna give the gateway full topology information for its stripes. And from the traffic demand and the topology, we can now do path computation. Very straightforward. We can optimize our capacity. We can avoid link congestion, both on the uplink and on the downlink. And both are absolutely necessary. Um, there's nothing new and fancy about this. Um, we do all this path computation all the time in terrestrial networks. Uh, yes, there we typically use RSVP and do setup, but we're not gonna do that here. We're just gonna use SR and produce SID lists. Okay, I, my clicker is no longer working. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think everybody here knows SRMPLS pretty well, uh, but basically we're going to have a SID list here. Um, one of the things that we also introduced in area proxy was con the uh, concept of an area SID. And this turns out to be very useful in this case. Um, this is just a SID that's assigned to the area and it's easy to compute because L2 is going to give you the area um, so it's absolutely trivial. Uh, so the, we can do traffic engineering and we can do a fancy SID list like what you see here, node SIDs, link SIDs, the whole nine yards, okay? And if we're gonna then do on-stripe forwarding, let's say we've got a packet at the gateway and we're gonna put it, send it through one stripe to the user station, then all we need is a single list SID and that's going to be the SID, a node SID for the satellite that's directly over the user station. And then you have an IP packet, and based on the destination address, the satellite can downlink to the right user station. Okay, Very simple case, one label. If we're going to do off-stripe forwarding, we just need to add an area label. And then we have our satellite node SID, and we're done. Okay. Uh, question? Don't I'm showing. Yeah. You want to ask your question now? Oh. This is Dongyuan from DT Corporation. Thanks for the work. And I got two questions. And firstly, with my understanding of your work, that uh, the surface of the Earth, that the surface of the uh, satellite could be uh, divided into stripes with the corresponding uh, areas of IGP. So my question is, uh, with most circumstances, that a, the satellite of, the, of an orbit may move, uh, has a, an inclination, that's an angle between the vertical uh, central axis of the Earth. So, is there any influence of the, the moves of this motion? And my second question is um, that's when some some of the satellites enter maybe a specific area, maybe the polar area, and the links between these satellites may just lose connection for the whole time because they enter a specific area. So, uh, with these considerations, that maybe the current IGP mechanism that they, they send the hello packets. So is that an appropriate 
way or mechanism, or should it be modified? Um, let me try to answer those in order. Um, yes, absolutely. Orbits have an inclination with respect to the planet, um, and my PowerPoint skills suck, so uh, they can't show that nicely. But absolutely, that is an issue, and different orbits are have an inclination with respect to each other, so yeah. they disconnect from each other. Again, ISLs are not stable. Yeah. So we're just seeing link churn all over the place. OK. 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 Um, could you say your second question again, please? Oh, uh, yeah. That's a, the satellite may enter the, some specific areas, maybe the polar area, periodically. So when they enter the specific areas, they may lose this connection uh, for the whole uh, process of, the, of their uh, location when they are in the polar area. So we know that for IGP mechanisms, they will uh, send maybe hello packets to hold this connection or neighbor relationship. So, uh, but we, we know that this is the fact that they cannot build the connection in a specific area. So is there any necess necessity to uh, modify the IGP mechanism? Uh, I don't know of any need to modify the IGP. Um, yes, we're going to lose ISL connectivity. That's yeah. just part of it. Like I said, everything's flaky in this scenario. Uh, so what we'll see is that things disconnect, and then sometime later they will reconnect. Yeah. And the point is, is only that we want to make sure that that routing churn doesn't tank the IGP. Okay, I got it. Okay, thanks. And thank you, Tony. I think it's a very good uh, uh, presentation. I have a question. Uh, you just mentioned the segment routing will be a good solution for the satellite uh, network. I, I totally agree. Uh, and the, uh, you uh, think the MPRS SR will be a good solution. But from my point of view, even MPRS uh, uh, SR, the over height is too high for the satellite uh, network because, uh, you know, the bandwidth for the satellite is really expensive. So is that possible? Uh, you know, uh, amperes, we need a, a 30 bit for labor. Maybe we can short it uh, such as a 16 bit because uh, the satellite number is much less than the router uh, in the earth, right? So 16 bit maybe is enough. So maybe uh, something like uh, the CC the solution for SF6 will be more efficient, right? Um, so I did not go to SRV6 because I very much wanted to support IPv4 too. And, and SRV6 has even more overhead than SRMPLS. So I definitely did not go that direction. Uh, could you do something that is fully customized link layer to do this? Absolutely, of course you could. Uh, but I was trying to do something with what we have on the shelf. Um, this is this is completely protocols and code that we have today, um, and not inventing anything brand new. So. Yeah, even uh, if we uh, use IPv4, uh, I think it, if. Uh, it's necessary we can develop some uh, segment routing with a, such as a 16 bit labor instead of uh, reusing MPRs 32 bit, right? Because uh, you, it's again, more efficient. You could, you could do any proprietary hack you want. No question about that. That's not the point. Again, well, I'm trying to do this with code, with hardware that we have today. You, you, can, you can implement this with existing chips. Okay, thank you. Yes, Tony, you want to finish your presentations? Well, oh, if people have questions, I'll, you know, like I said, this is a discussion. Okay. I'd rather discuss them before we get too more mired down. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Robin from Huawei. Uh, in fact, my question similar as the Wei Qiang's the comments. So uh, because uh, we know the SRMPRs, so we think that you know, the label stack you know, still has the uh, much overhead. Have you, when you thinking about this one, uh, how about this uh, uh, thinking reuse the existing the MPRS mechanism for uh, traffic engineering because that's only the single label. 
Well, you could use traditional RSVP for doing this, but that requires that you do LSP setup. Mm -hmm. And when the path is changing every, say, 15 seconds, that seems like a lot of overhead that you're creating, mm -hmm. okay? This is very nice because the gateway can do all this computation in the background and you can stuff it full of CPUs and do as much of it in parallel as you want. And the result is that the label stack changes, but you only need to deal with that when you actually have a packet for that destination. Okay, that's relatively straightforward and there's no signaling you have to do. The gateway just slaps a label stack on it and it sends it. So this is actually not bad. And as you can see, in the very common case where you're doing off stripe forwarding, you're only adding two labels. So you've got 64 bits of overhead. I'll take that. Uh, Tenji, uh, CMCC here. I, I tried to uh, dis describe something, but the jumping of the, the IGP or BGP box here. Because for the Leo meal or the geo things, we have a, a word called the ephemeris. So basically, the tracking of uh, object or orbit of a satellite is predictable. So the thing is here, you know, there are some real requirements uh, from some other uh, organization talking about how to use this information that provided through ephemeris. That means you do not need to use the IGP BGP to run the full dynamic thing to do the work. You have indication or enough information to do the work in advance. I disagree. Okay, that's um, fine. But you, just ha the... you have lots of information. I agree completely. You have in uh, information about what's possible, but you do not have information about what does work. And there will be failures that you do not expect. Okay. Um, the thing is, well, we, we can discuss about that thing, but I just try to give us uh, something here. The other part, I think the previous uh, uh, participant already talked about like uh, the environment is very harsh uh, on space. And also the capability of hardware is very limited. I can give you the data. I think there's a testing of uh, this is published already. It's uh, between two uh, satellites launched by our company. The SL can only provide up to 230 minutes uh, million, millibit per second bandwidth for the ISL. Uplink 10 millibit per second, downlink five. So if you consider the thing together, to run a dynamic IGP BGP is out of the picture. I, uh, I have private information, which I cannot share, which disagrees with your information. <laughs> okay, th th that's fine. Well, you know, you can say, okay, well, I have around something with a five gig already. Well, this is it. But I try to give the fact, the truth, to publish the data, and also like from the three GPP part, they have something to have already standardized from the release 18, the previous one, and doing some work with 19, trying to give something. But I, you know, I disagree with your point. Like to run a full like a MPOS, SRV, all kind of things is not going to work. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll point out that you don't have to run anything funky on the satellite. What you're running here is just one instance of ISIS. That's it. And um, this has been done on 16 megahertz, 68,000s. So. All right. Um, let's see. We were, uh, any other questions at this point? Yes, yeah, so we're cutting the queue. And, uh, okay. Um, if there are other questions, do come to the mic. Um, so uh, just to continue, if you're returning packets from a user station to the gateway, then you have a very simple, similar issue, and you have a node SID for the gateway, you slap that on your packet, now you've got a random IP destination, but the, the node SID is sufficient to get it to the gateway, and node gateway presumably has full routing. Here. Hey, sorry, I didn't mean so, to interrupt. So, but here, tell our hold case. on a second. Uh, after you join the queue and ask your questions, please make sure you remove yourself from the queue so we don't have uh, a Thank you. That's what yeah. got me confused. Uh, but here, you tell our case. Um, both the idea of uh, uh, the gateway here and the slice that you have mm -hmm. are pretty cute. I think they will inherently give robustness uh, knowing that you are trying to interconnect between different orbits. 
the question I had was the orbits are always predefined and you know certain kind of failures will happen ahead of time. So are you trying to bake that in and do automatic rerouting at certain time of the day in the protocol itself? Is that planned? We, um, yes, we, you are completely correct. We know that those failures are going to happen. Actually, as far as I can tell, we don't need to bake it in too much. Okay, the gateway can think about it because he's going That's to do the I path mean. computation and he knows that this link is going to fail so he doesn't route via that link. So he can think ahead. That, but the routing protocol doesn't have to. Agree. That's what I meant. That do gateways will do that and do you have that pre-baked into the solution? And then the I'm second assuming, I'm just assuming that. Super. Okay. And then the second question I had was, do you have certain a matrix or parameters where you say, hey, from a gateway perspective, this is the load that you are expecting on a routers that are a systems that are shipped up in the satellite. And here is the computational power you should assume. Um, so I have not had to bake anything special in, assuming that, because the gateway does have full information for what's going on. So it can do a lot of things in real time. Got it. Um, and so that's probably not an issue. Um, I will point out that one thing we do want from the routing protocols is that we do want links, uh, link liveness. Uh, that's an important property. Yes, the schedule will tell us when links should come up. It's important to distinguish between that and they did come up. Okay, There are going to be lots of cases where links don't come up right when you want them to. And throwing traffic across a link that isn't quite there yet is a bad idea. Okay. Um, off stripe return forwarding is pretty straightforward as well. You need an area label and then a gateway, and you're done. Okay. So 64 bits to get out, 64 bits to get back. That's acceptable overhead in my book. Um, you'll notice I haven't had, said anything about IP addressing. That's because this is pretty much IP address independent. Uh, this, the the, the uh, satellites do need to know the IP addresses of the user stations that they are talking to, but those do not need to be aggregated in the satellite network in any way. Uh, they all come from a single prefix assigned to the gateway, and presumably the gateway is going to advertise that out to the internet. Um, this is very nice because it finesses Rector's law. Addressing aligns with topology, very simple. So this seems like a relatively easy and straightforward way to do routing for satellites. Um, it's using existing off-the-shelf software and hardware. Um, it scales to very large networks as far as we can see. It's got very low overhead on the forwarding plane, supports both V4 and V6 without a problem. If we someday get to V7, we can do that too. And gives us full TE functionality, which we really need. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> Jinong from Huawei. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, first, I agree that uh, the scalability and the stability will be very important in this scenario. So it is, uh, we need to consider how to minimize the churn in the network. And, uh, but the second is, uh, in your uh, proposal, you partitioned the network into stripes. That mm -hmm. may help the uh, stability, but may uh, result in an uh, optimal pass in forwarding. If you use a one seat to represent a stripe, how can you get the optimal shorted pass? Remember the... that the gateway has full information. Yeah. Uh, he has L1 connectivity, not L2. Okay, so the, the gateway sees all links and he does not see stripe boundaries. You mean every gateway will get both uh, L1 and uh, L2? L2, L2 is almost irrelevant for the gateway. But for okay. all the L1? For the topology information, you get all of that from L1. And the gateway needs to know about all stripes that are going to cover its service area. Yeah, but the, each gateway only gets L1 information of its own uh, area, or it gets all the, for all the stripes? It you needs need... it for all the stripes that are going to cover its area. It doesn't need all stripes on the planet. Okay. Yeah. Let's, do that. let's say that we have one gateway that's serving California. Yeah. Okay. We're, California is pretty wide. It may need three, four, five stripes to cover it. 
and maybe the Earth has got 30. Okay, so the gateway only needs the topology information from those five stripes, and then it has full information and can do any traffic engineering it wants. It's got full topology. Yeah, the traffic engineering is within this area. He get the topology right. Yeah. Get to the X point of this area to the maybe another stripe, and that part you cannot control which X point you will will be the best. Again, what I was trying to focus on, and what you're asking is certainly doable, but what I'm focusing on in this talk is just the access network. Access network. Okay. Oh. Where we're, we've got users and we're trying to provide internet access. Yeah. Okay. If you want to do transit, you can do transit, but you have to have more information. And that one, if you want to do that, you basically have to take all topology information to every gateway. That's yeah. an expensive proposition, and I think people want to think hard before they do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another uh, question is- Jill, we will run out of time, okay. so if you have more questions, uh, okay. please take it to the list. I can be quick, uh, very brief quick question about the traffic engineering. You said it's uh, important for the gateway and now for, also for the user station. Are the user station, if they need uh, to put the seed list into the package, so where did, does it get the information? Does the user station also need the topology information or it will rely on the controller. Ah, so the user station gets the information it needs and it only needs either a single gateway SID or an area gateway SID. And it can get that from its overhead satellite. So there's no more SID for the user station side to be- You don't full. need a SID if you don't want to. You, you, I do mention a variant in the paper where you have a node SID per user station, but you don't really need it. Okay, thank you. We can discuss further. All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm very interested in working group adoption. Thank you. We have one more question for you. Oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask if you have an algorithm for selecting the orbits that form uh, the area or the stripes that form the area because you're guaranteeing that the formation doesn't cause uh, area partition, right? Yes, I only have a requirement. I don't have an algorithm for you. Okay, because the topological changes may be a lot. So how do you prove that your choice doesn't uh, result in a, an area partition? Uh, again, I have a requirement. If the choice does not meet the requirement, then it's the bad choice. And I don't know enough about the details of your particular network to help you. Thank you. Uh, Dmitry. Uh, yeah, thanks for a very interesting presentation. An idea with stripes is certainly good and interesting. Uh, my question is, uh, um, didn't you think about introducing one more um, intermediate object? Because essentially, if you look at the satellite network, uh, probably simplest reasonable configuration is satellites with Redix 4 uh, for intersatellite links. And essentially, if we forget about curvature or whatever else, it's 2D torus mapped to the surface of Earth. But it's moving with respect to the surface of Earth. So, and um, at least some architectures, as far as I know, they are using kind of cells which are stable with respect to the geography. Uh, did you think about introducing one additional seed for those cells? to use um, uh, some stable identifier, which is stable with respect to the surface of Earth, not with respect to the satellites. Uh, I was trying to avoid any connection to the surface uh, simply because we don't need it and we don't want it. It means we have to have mappings back and forth between the satellite topology and the surface and it gets confusing. Uh, so it yep, seemed better to... Uh, those uh, mappings uh, should be calculable at the end point in most cases. Well, I've I mean, seen... orbits are predictable. Well, I think the orbits have some high degree of predictability, but um, I, again, I'm not a satellite guy. Um, uh, what I have seen is other people doing geographic addressing, and, and I have some concerns about how that operates especially if there are interesting link failures. It seems like if you're just forwarding based on geography, you could end up in a cul-de-sac and unable to forward or 
quickly end up in a routing loop. Um, this seems like a serious problem. So I was trying to finesse all of that. Uh, yeah, I was thinking actually about the use case where we uh, it's terminal to terminal without gateways, just uplink, intersatellite links down to another terminal. Uh, and to get to not think about IP addresses, but still have some way to address geographic area. Uh, okay, if you want to do user station to user station, that's doable, but that's very painful because now user stations have to have a lot more information, especially if you want to do meaningful TE. Um, I was, tr again, I was trying to deal with the access problem. Uh, I think that's the number one thing that people are going to want to do. So I'm trying to eat, I'm trying to solve the easy problem first. <laughs> Thanks, Dima. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. So we are going to Paul, the working group to see whether we should continue this work here. And as a working group chairs, it's not the first presentation of satellite networking, right? We've been having this presentation over the last three years. Unfortunately, there's zero input from the industry. So a lot of the discussion are happening in the vacuum and you know, to our limited routing understanding. So it's really our cry to the industry and some of the people are in the room, please, do help us with requirements. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> help us with requirements so we can build something that actually makes sense, that works in, if not in production, that can work, right? So, and if there's enough interest, potentially we could have also interim that people can discuss their ideas in more details. But let's run the formal. For this call, especially if you are against us taking some, taking up, pick up some of the work, please say no. Yeah. So we clearly see support and interest. So. We will, after this ATF, we will poll the working group if there's enough interest to actually have interim between now and uh, this, yeah, 120. Yeah, just on the satellite routing. Yeah. Cool, okay. thanks. I'm going to terminate the poll. So let's go to the next presentation. Robin. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Robin. So today I will uh, represent uh, present this the application aware networking, and the first part will reveal the process of the APM framework draft, and then. Uh, present the application side extension for APM framework that's related with two drafts. Uh, the first draft is the application aware networking framework draft uh, present on behalf of these co-authors. Uh, so uh, in fact, uh, this uh, is the zero, zero, zero draft. Uh, in fact, it's replaced the uh, APM framework draft uh, in the APM both. Uh, so this uh, framework is uh, defined the encapsulation of application aware information uh, known as the APN attribute uh, within the packet traverse an APN domain. Uh, this information uh, including the application identification and the APN parameters. Uh, this information uh, is encapsulated at the network edge device. Uh, the purpose is to facilitate the service provision, enable fine granulated uh, traffic steering 
and support network resource adjustment. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, draft has experienced a long history. Uh, the, in fact, it is proposed uh, in the 2020, has presented in the different uh, places and uh, proposed uh, to the APN working group uh, set up. Uh, but uh, later, the APN working group set up process was abandoned. So the co-authors would like to uh, continue to promote this draft in the RTD WD working group uh, instead of looking for promote it in the specific working group or both. Uh, here, this is the framework. From here, we can see that the uh, APN framework is the in the limited control domain. The information is encapsulated in the network edge device. That means there's no change about this, the applications. That means the any packet from the application side sent to the APN domain, and the, the APN attribute can be encapsulated in the packet and uh, stripped off this information uh, at the edge of the APN domain. So that uh, means this all application aware informations are only used in one controlled domain. Uh, so this, uh, in fact, this draft has been published in the 2020. Uh, so it has had several rounds of the refinement. So and uh, address the possible comments. So we would like to ask for the working group adoption in the RTD WD. Uh, in fact, this uh, work will be go on to be extended. So that uh, means this uh, framework to be extended to application side. So now that's the first draft was being proposed before the IETF 118. Uh, so this draft is the APN application side framework. Uh, this document extended the APN framework to incorporate the application side consideration. Uh, this means the APN resources in the APN domain are allocated to applications and uh, applications uh, in, uh, compose and uh, encapsulate the APN attribute within the packet. So then the network device can directly take use of the information in the original packet for final granulated services. Uh, so from here, we can see this, the, see this is the extension of the APN framework. So this is the APN controller. So it uh, will allocate the APN resource to the application server on demand. That means the server can apply for this the APN resource from this the controller. So then after the resource has been allocated to the application server, so it can also allocate the specific this is the application aware information to the application client. So then this application aware information can be encapsulated by the APN capable this client and send it to the APN domain. So this network edge device can authenticate this APN information. So then this is the APN key points in the APN domain can be enforced the policy for this, the final granularity services. Same on the other part, when the server, APN capable server, send this the traffic to the client, it will encapsulate this information in the packet and send to the APN domain. And this the network device in the APN domain can be, uh, can enforce a policy for the services according to application aware information. Uh, okay, so this is the comparison between these the two frameworks, or this is the APN framework and the extension of the APN framework for the application side. Uh, the first aspects is the encapsulation 
of this the APN information. For APN framework, the information encapsulated by the network edge device. And for this the application side extension, this encapsulated by applications. And the second one, and the transmission scope of the APN information. So this is the APN information only used in the APN domain. That means has nothing with the applications. And for the application side the extension, it's end to end. That means from this the application client to the APN domain, and then to the application server. And uh, then this is the allocation of the APN ID. So for this, the APN framework, this APN ID is allocated by the controller to the network edge device. And so when the packet arrived at the edge device, it can encapsulate the APN ID information. Uh, for this, the application side extension, so this information is allocated from the controller to these applications. That means this application ID will, uh, after this the allocated from the controller to the application, and then this is allocated from this the application server to the application client. And then this security and the privacy concern, because this is the, for the APN framework, because this information only used in the control the limited domain, so this is has the less security and the privacy concern. But for this the application side extension, because this information is sent end to end from the application client side to the APN domain and then to the server. So that is transverse multiple domain. So that is proposed more security and the privacy concern. So this issue must be coped with carefully and in details. And then the last, so this is the key components for, oh, sorry, I make a mistake. So this is, in fact, for the APN framework. So this is only the controller, APN edge, and only this is the APN head, midpoint, and the endpoint. So that means only devices in the APN domain. But for the application extensions, so, that in, so that's at two key components. One is the APN-capable application server. Another is the APN capable application client. So that means the application side are involved in the extension of the APN framework for the application side. Okay, so here is just uh, quickly to go through these uh, new components. For this, the APN, uh, this uh, capable application server. So that's you uh, will request this APN resource from the APN controller in the APN domain. So then it will uh, also allocate this the resource to the application capable uh, application client on demand. So that's, uh, this is the uh, functionality of this the uh, APN applicable server. And uh, another uh, new component is application where uh, this is the application client. So this means uh, this client will request the server to allocate the APN resource. So then this client can compose this APN attribute and encapsulate this information in the packet and send to the APN domain. Okay. So after that, so that's the Existing that's the key components in the APN domain also need to be extended or this changed. For example, this is the APN edge. So that at the beginning for the APN framework, it will encapsulate the APN information for the packet. But because in the APN framework for the application side, this information has been encapsulated by the applications. So for the APN edge, the enhanced functionality, the most important functionality to authenticate this information. That means must be aligned with this the uh, policy uh, in the APN domain and to avoid, avoid introducing the security issues 
So this is can be seen an example. And so then this is for example the A pin head. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, for this is the A pin edge because this is the information is uh, information is encapsulated uh, firstly in the original packet because this is the A pin edge. Maybe add some this is the new encapsulations so that it must be copy this is the A pin information from this is the uh, uh, from this original packet to the outer, outer this is the packet encapsulation. So this is the most change. Okay, so later this will for this is the uh, head and the midpoint, this is the end point, and the code can directly to take use of the APN information for the policy enforcement. And also this is the change of this APN controller because this is the new functionality. It needed to allocate a resource to the APN client, uh, APN server, like this one. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is the second, I think this is the most important, the security consideration because this information is sent from the a server client and the APN domain. So that's we must need this the robust security measures. So this must be mechanism must be uh, proposed. And so later the more details will be proposed. So here this is just uh, is list of some of the requirements. So that's the, for example, the protocol extension that is request the resource by the application server to the controller. And also that you send this resource from the controller to the uh, application uh, server. And also we need some protocols, uh, inter information exchange between this the client and also this is the server. Okay, okay so here, uh, just uh, we'll not see the details, but uh, this is, means the APM framework extension for the application side. Say so there's the more user cases and the requirement. So this is the user cases, including this the, for the media services and for this the data center, and also for this computing network. Okay, that means this will must use that's the uh, APM framework extension for the application side. Okay, so this is the uh, next step. So this is uh, there is a draft. So that we would like to solicit comments and uh, refine solutions and the draft. And then we would like to welcome this the more cooperations. Okay, that's all. So I'll I'll start the discussion. Then we'll take questions. Mm -hmm. uh, since you brought the adoption of framework, mm -hmm. we are still considering what has been discussed many years ago. Mm -hmm. The work is out of scope of routing working group. Mm -hmm. You wanted to proceed work on getting working group. The fact that ISG disagrees to form a working group should be representative for a wide variety of opinion, mm -hmm. right? So we give you time mm -hmm. to provide updates from time to time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that routing working group is a home for APN work. We aren't, it's not in our scope mm -hmm. and again, when you talk to working group, you see people actively disagreeing with this work being done here. And uh, since we are rough consensus organization, we should honor what people think about it. Mm -hmm. So again, you are here because mm -hmm. there was new work done on application side of things. Mm -hmm. We wanted to provide you a way to provide the updates. Practically, it is out of scope of routing working group. Please mm -hmm. consider this. Mm, okay, thanks. Oh. Questions? Yeah. Uh, Daniel, go ahead. Ah, okay. uh, Daniel Huang, ZT. Um, as far as uh, coordination between application and networks, I believe uh, APM is a reasonable framework and a good start point. Um, but um, I have a um, question and a concern uh, with, um, with regard to the uh, AP application attributes. Um, in your framework, you claimed the attributes will be encapsulated in the user package. Mm. Uh, but um, uh, uh, from uh, my personal point of view, um, the uh, ap application attributes is, um, um, could be 
could be managed to, and it, by the management and the control plane. So um, uh, if it's encapsulated in the user package, it will be, there will be some um, overhead problems. Mm. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. This is Hong Yi. And on behalf of our authors, I want to present here for the first time there is an application where data center network use cases and requirements following the last uh, presentation. And that's the background that is, uh, this, uh, there is a great uh, intent of distributed AI model training in data centers. And because large AI models require uh, heavy distributed training among thousands of uh, accelerators, and they will generate synchronized, periodic, and large uh, flows to exchange the intermediate results, and that is to upgrade gradients between accelerators before a uh, next generation. So, and, and there will be multiple and uh, many iterations during the whole training. And now new mechanisms are proposed uh, because this uh, distributed, distributed training has a great and, and influence on the network and there are new mechanisms uh, to be proposed to serve AI training applications to meet the network bottlenecks. And so, um, but um, look to uh, look into these mechanisms. We can see that there is a, a demanding of better collaboration between the network and the whole site, and they can greatly improve the application efficiency. And the other insight is that information for collab collaboration needs to be carried in packets from the end to the network or in the reverse direction. And, and let me briefly introduce several uh, use cases. And the first is to enhance the distributed learning and with in-network computing. And as one of the MPI uh, message passing interface, all reduces widely used in uh, each iteration during the training and all reduce and we uh, reduce uh, they what they do is to reduce the value from multiple processors and to distribute the results to all processors finally. And, and there could be some uh, architecture like parameter server, it will act as a server, uh, a central server to collect the uh, gradients from multiple clients and they will make some aggregation and finally they distribute the uh, gradients to updated gradients to uh, to those uh, clients, uh, but we uh, but they will uh, is prone to in, induce some in cost congestions uh, from the perspective of a server. And now we, with in network computing, uh, it will offload the behavior of server to the switch, uh, and the switch is capable of nitro processing of aggregation and it will greatly eliminate the in-cast congestion. Uh, so to enable INC in network computing in the switches, the host needs to expose the, the intent of the application to be cal calculated and the, co the content to be calculated. And we can see that current implementations and they require the switches to pass upper layer protocols and understand application specific logic that is dedicated to certain application. And uh, we can see that there is a gap to, uh, for INC switches to support uh, different transports and application layers. And also uh, it's difficult to fetch INC information uh, with some uh, encryption method apply. 
So there could be some, uh, could be the potential solution to use APN to uh, is expose the uh, INC operations and information uh, to be performed uh, in, in a switch. And there also be some uh, requirements that APN should carry application identifier to dif uh, distinguish different INC tasks and also carry the um, format and length of application data and the expected operations. And also should carry other application aware information and uh, carry complete the INC results and record the computation status in the data packet. And okay. And the second use case is to find, uh, to enable fine grade packet scheduling for low balancing. And in traditional data center, they, are, they usually use per flow ECMP. And, but in distributed large model, distributed learning synchronized, large flows may be distributed to the same paths and, and further incur congestions. So currently, uh, usually, Mm, adopt five grade per packet ECMP, and but it will lead to packet disorder due to multi passing of the packets, and uh, we can find some experiments to show the impact of disorder. So there could be one solution to target this is to reorder the packets in the ingress switch or NICs without modifying and affecting the end host transports. So the packets will be uh, sprayed in the in ingress switch and later be reordered. And so in this use case, the sequence of uh, packets need to be carried on different uh, hosts and uh, through hosts, uh, different hosts and network devices along with the pa data packets. And now we can see that only transport application layer carries such sequence number. And there are different transport and application layers. And each transport applications, uh, they require separate reordering queue uh, in such implementation. And currently, uh, transport uh, sequence number is not supposed to be modified by the network, but the, in this case, uh, in, in this use case, we require it to be modified. So uh, there could be potential to use APDN, and it can encapsulate each packet with sequence number, and besides APN ID for reordering, and the sequence number in APN um, should not be uh, modified in, inside the multi-pass uh, domain and can be clear from the APN in the, at the ingress device, but it can be modified in the ingress device. Okay. And last, APN should be able to carry necessary queue information that is uh, useful for fine grain reordering, reordering process uh, in the egress. And the last use case is to enhance congestion control with precise feedback mechanisms. Uh, like AI data centers is prone to incur many congestion control during some in cost congestion or unbalanced load distribution among different paths. And ECN currently um, use it was only one bit market, marker unable to transmit more congestion information. And we can see that newly uh, congestion control acquisitions are encouraged to collect and on collect more information uh, or even update the information hole by hole to help locate the congestion uh, points and to locate the congestion uh, reason and support fine grain con control. And the applications uh, should specify the required network information in this scheme. Um, they should indicate their intent in the packet and the information will finally return to the application to uh, help the congestion control. Um, so there should some information exchange between the host and end, uh, host and switch. And there could be potential uh, solution to use APN 
for the application side to carry such information to determine the type of information to be collected and also um, we uh, uh, collect the information in APN as well. Okay, then there are three cases we show and now we ask for comments and welcome operation and more details of the use cases will be shared in APN side meeting in Thursday. Thank you. We've got uh, one person in the queue. Uh, please be quick. So we are running. Uh, hey, thank you very much for yes. this talk. Uh, this is Zili from Hong Kong USD. Just wondering uh, what kind of different information you need to carry when you are training different neural networks. Let's say for a transformer, you may have one kind of information. But for other neural network structures, do you need yeah. any additional information or are they uh, necessarily similar to each other? Thanks. Uh, similar structure. Right, yeah. the information the applicant need to carry. Yes, yeah, so we, we so they will carry different. You you say that you they will carry different information, and so we have them uh, in the same format or in the same right, structure, right, exactly, and right. uh, we hopefully to do so. And we hoped and there, so we only show the use cases and requirements. There could be some uh, detail solutions and welcome cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we probably don't have time for the very last presentation. Sorry to the presenters. Yeah, you go okay. ahead. We only have like five minutes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm from the China Uncom. I'm very glad to share my topic about the use case and the requirements for implementing lossless techniques in wide area networks. Okay. So first thing is the introduction. In introduction, we will outlines the critical need for the lossless state transmission in once. And first, we'll show some three use cases and two folks who influence the um, loss state transmission. It's important. And uh, we'll uh, analyze the problem need. And, and finally, we'll um, raise the sound direction. OK. And this is the title of the use case. Um, then that's the meets the um, first is the use case one. It's about the high performance computing for the scientific research. Uh, and in some studies about the um, chemical experiment, such as the PS2 proteins, and it will reduce the 60 to 100 gigabytes of the data every five minutes. And uh, it uh, needed the rapid and the loss data transfer from the equipment back to analyze the labs. It's a very long instance. So the efficiency and the reliability of the ones in the scenario and benefit and extension. And uh, we needed to facilitate the seamless collaboration between the many scientific scientists. They are in the different uh, long domains and we will enable them to share and analyze the large data based data sites effectively. And the second one, it's about the genetic sequencing um, accompanied with the exponential, exponential growth of genetic sequencing. And it uh, will produce the many, many data volumes and it required efficient and the lossless transmission to crowd all his private data center for analysis. So the demand for the high speed reliable data transfer is evident. So, but, uh, but the existing network, existing ones, transfer efficiency present a significant bottlenecks. It extends the turn around the times for sequencing service and the impacts the timely data delivery of precision medicine. The third one is about the large scale of the audio and video data migration. 
In the traditional methods, we also um, transmit uh, this data of the video and just uh, like uh, use the physical media, just like the storage and we transport uh, through the vehicle. And these, methods, and these ways are not only time consuming, but also e efficiently. So the requirement for a wine, we will an infrastructure and be capable of handling such a extensive data transfer and the rapid and the um, lossless is very important. So according to the use cases, we focused uh, to send a giant data to a long distance location. We will through the wider area network uh, and we should need the one efficiently and the reliably. So we rely on, naturally we rely on the traditional transmission protocols such as the TCP or the RDMA. Um, however, the both protocols are adversely affected by one factor, it's the packet losses, especially over long haul transmissions. We can see the two figures in above. The left one is about the TCP. We can see the transmission rate dropped dramatically when the packet loss rate is up to the 0.001%. And the right one is about the RDMA. We can see also the normalized through, through input um, also dropped dramatically. And when the packet loss rate uh, is up to 0.1%. So we think how to um, request for lossless data, data transformation in wide area. Um, it's uh, confronted with uh, significant challenges, um, just like the elephant, elephant flows. Uh, it can cause the entertainers congestions and packed loss within the network device queues because our device is, um, doesn't have the infinite buffer. Um, we think. Uh, Can you uh, hurry up, please? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Mm, okay, we think that uh, we can whether we can use the the technology in the DC just like the PFC and the ECN. But uh, during our research, we think we think the in the wines the PFC and the ECN are not uh, make the good uh, effects because the wine is a large topic with the metal many nodes and it's a long distance. So, so our requirements and our uh, direction is about we first we think we whether we can improve our PFC and the ECN for the lost state transmission events. So maybe we also have uh, and some other solutions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We are out of time. Uh, in meanwhile, before one cover, we will assess whether we need to have an uh, interim meeting. We are closed. Sorry, interim meeting on the satellite networking and routing. And such okay, the pressure you can discuss to the email. Thank you. And we will see you in Vancouver. Thanks. And we do hear your opinions about APN. So we, we are going to Octopan. Thank you, everybody. I, my slides has been answer, right? So I understand the time is out. So the slides will be on the agenda of the interim meeting. Sorry? No, so we didn't. The yeah, slides are there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean um, a world size is the agenda of the interim meeting. No, so interim, we discussed specifically about satellite networking, not interim as extension of this meeting, right? So we'll try another idea. I mean, I don't think we can have interim just on your slides. That's definitely not. Uh, it's not enough advanced work to ask working group to attend interim just to look at your slides, right? Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, people are definitely interested in uh, satellite work. And uh, so I talked to Padma, she said she cannot talk about this, she'll get fired. So uh, maybe we should. No, I already did. She, she said she cannot do it.